Phil, you've got to help us. What are we going to do? Hello, Howard. I am the reviewer. Undoubtedly, one of Earth's greatest minds here. Hey, Phil, don't talk to him like that. He's just as smart as you are. Oh, now I'm really depressed. Okay, if you're so smart, why don't you use your superpowers and read my mind? You're thinking, they know I'm a phony. They know I'm a yo-yo. <laughs> Tell me if I'm warm on any of these, Phil. Nice try, duck brain. But I was thinking, this is movie night. Hello and welcome to Movie Night, in-depth, analytical, professionally made film reviews in less than five minutes. I'm your host, Jonathan Paula. Tonight we close out the sixth season of the show with our third annual look at the worst movies of all time, at least according to IMDb's Bottom 100 and Wikipedia's List of Films Considered the Worst, both of which are linked below. Originally I was going to review Kirk Cameron's Saving Christmas tonight. Sadly, however, that movie is simply unwatchable. And I don't mean that it's so bad I had to shut it off, but like literally unwatchable. I could not find a DVD, stream, download, or copy of this movie anywhere. So instead I've swapped it out for something equally as terrible. We begin tonight with the oldest of tonight's five cinematic failures, The Conqueror. Where do I start with this one? A pet project of reclusive aviator Howard Hughes, his last production in fact. This western epic from director Dick Powell cost six million to make and premiered in February of 1956. Clearly blinded by its recognizable stars, audiences helped this clumsy film earn some nine million in proceeds. The approved rated story hilariously features John Wayne in the title role as Temujin, a Mongol warrior in the 13th century who would rise to power to become Genghis Khan. Let that sink in for a minute. America's most recognizable cowboy at the prime of his career was selected to play an Asian warrior. Racial insensitivity notwithstanding, this might be the single worst casting decision in the history of film. Covered in a thin layer of what appears to be brown face, the Duke is downright embarrassing, mugging for the camera in his goofy looking mustache and shouting dialogue in his trademark timbre, with no attempt to change his voice. That's bad enough considering the stilted writing he's forced to deliver resembles a broken haiku. There are moments for wisdom and moments when I listen to my blood. My blood says, take this tartar woman, Wayne declares before riding out to capture an enemy princess, played by Susan Hayward. She's stiff and disinterested, sharing absolutely zero chemistry with her brawny co-star. Where is Jamoga? I am here, my brother. What are the markets? Routed and well bloodied. But Subaya was wounded, half his men slain. Men we shall miss when the Tartars descend upon us. Leave the Tartars to me. As with the markets? I dealt gently with this, Ulf. If others would speak, let it be now. Now thanks to Dan Carlin's incredibly fascinating podcast series, Wrath of the Cons, I went into this movie already knowing what a powerful, influential, ruthless, sex-crazed warrior Temujin really was. But The Conqueror shares none of this backstory, instead reducing his entire legacy down to a silly romance story with bad costumes. Khan didn't nervously ask for a girl's attention like a timid teenager before prom. This is a man who literally raped thousands of women during his travels. One useless sequence plays out like a rejected grade school recital, with scantily clad women prancing around for no one's amusement, before Hayward takes to the floor in a failed assassination attempt. The 111 minute picture contains a fair amount of action, including some impressive horseback riding and stunt work, but thanks to the identical looking players and flat cinematography, it's impossible to really tell what's going on. And when Powell punches in for the rare close-up, it results in laughably unrealistic fight choreography. The wide cinemascope lens also creates a rather distracting barreling effect on the sides of the frame, most obvious during the movie's many panning shots. The audio, meanwhile, is especially awful. I can't tell if it was a botched ADR job or recorded through a tin can on the end of a string. The Mexican and Native American supporting cast might pass for Asian soldiers in the right lighting, but Utah's Moavi region is a poor substitute for Mongolia's Gobi Desert. Speaking of lighting, though, it sucks. Completely inconsistent as Powell attempts to mix location work with scenes obviously shot back on a soundstage. The movie's most unforgiving mistake, though, lies not with its awful screenplay or bad acting, but with the production itself. Those aforementioned exteriors in Utah? Yeah, they were filmed downwind of the US government's nuclear weapons testing site. An estimated 91 people from the 220 person cast developed cancer, including the director who died of the disease just seven years later. 
Although Wayne himself attributed his lung and stomach cancer to an aggressive smoking habit, a scientist from the Pentagon's Defense Nuclear Agency reacted to his death by proclaiming, Please God, don't let us have killed John Wayne. Obsessed with this costly mistake, Hughes reportedly spent his final paranoid years watching this movie every night on repeat, spending $12 million of his own money to buy every last copy just for himself. Masquerading as a John Wayne Western, this movie is a monument of bad decisions, and although it really needs to be seen to be believed, you're better off simply not. The Conqueror is a train wreck of historic proportions and is simply garbage. For tonight's poll question, what is the most miscast role in cinema? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Next up tonight, The Exorcist II, The Heretic. Following the phenomenal success of the original, countless imitators in the horror genre emerged, including this R-rated sequel, which was released in June of 1977. Although the John Borman film doubled its budget, the $30 million take at the box office was only 7% of its predecessors. The 118-minute story is set four years after Linda Blair's demonic possession in the original, but unfortunately the teen is still dealing with lingering issues. Now older and not caked in layers of scary makeup, Blair is able to portray a more familiar teenage character, but her delivery ranges from weirdly enthusiastic or uncomfortably somber. Ellen Burns, who gave a brilliant performance in part one, wisely sat this picture out. But her presence is not only missed, it's also unaddressed. Instead, Blair is living in a Manhattan high-rise with a female guardian, played by Sharon Spencer. Their expensive-looking penthouse is covered in mirrored walls and is missing outdoor railings. Now, interior decorating might seem like a petty thing to complain about, but what made the imagery and themes of the first picture so effective was its Georgetown setting, a plain and relatable house most people can associate with fear. But a pigeon coop overlooking Fifth Avenue only a millionaire can afford? It hardly incites the same effect. When the action does return to that dark bedroom of the original exorcism, the result is too little too late. Anyone who hasn't checked out by then has the patience of a saint. I've been comparing this picture rather unfavorably to its predecessor, but if you caught my review of the original Exorcist, you might remember I didn't really care for that picture either. The entire premise of the sequel, though, is built on the supposition that Blair is somehow still possessed by the devil Pazuzu, which completely undermines the memorable conclusion of part one. As a result, this story is never interesting, with huge passages of time where nothing of substance happens at all. And then when it does, it remains unexplained. Progressing slower than a snail, the movie eventually morphs into a National Geographic special, when it takes a lengthy detour to show us the migratory patterns of grasshoppers. There's seriously like five solid minutes of this picture featuring close-ups of flying insects. It's an attempt to draw a parallel between demons and locusts, but the connection never really works, despite James Earl Jones' best efforts in a minor supporting role. There are moments of unintentional humor, though, like when newcomer Richard Burton attempts to extinguish a basement fire with a pair of crutches or the bizarre inclusion of a consciousness transfer device known as a synchronizer. Complete with obnoxious blinking lights, this mind meld tool is relied upon to advance some of the picture's most important plot points. Like when Burton shouts, your machine has proved scientifically that there's an ancient demon locked within her. How it works or qualifies as science, however, is never actually explained. <laughs> was it? A leopard. He jumped right at me. The boy is still alive. He, uh, he frightened Pazuzu. Do you remember anything? Was it in Africa? Why do you say that? Well, it was like something I saw with my class at the Natural History Museum. But you weren't supposed to remember anything. I know. True story, I watched the 90 second time lapse of Boston's massive snow melt the same day I saw this picture. Guess which was more interesting? The entire experience was insufferably boring and just plain stupid. Despite the universal disdain for the picture though, Hollywood didn't learn its lesson and would ultimately produce three more films in the franchise. The Exorcist II The Heretic is a colossal waste of time and an insult to its namesake. It's a piece of garbage. Our third film tonight is Howard the Duck. Based on the Marvel comic book of the same name, this science fiction comedy film by director Willard Hayek was originally going to be animated, but a contractual obligation required it to be live action. Strike one. Although the $37 million Lucasfilm production somehow broke even, the movie received overwhelmingly negative reviews upon its release in August of 1986. With the exception of a 15-chapter Captain America serial released in 1944, Howard the Duck has the notable distinction of being the first motion picture based on a Marvel comic. Let that sink in for a minute. The mega successful production studio that now figuratively prints money with a chain of endless hits got their start on the big screen with a talking duck. The 110 minute feature follows a sarcastic humanoid duck who is pulled from his homeworld to Cleveland, Ohio, where he teams up with a struggling musician to stop an evil alien intruder. 
The weird looking duck suit that brings the character to life cost $2 million and was operated by eight separate people over the course of the film. Ed Gale reportedly did the lion's share of the work, however, with Chip Zine providing the voice. We're introduced to this creature living a boring life as an advertising writer in a normal looking room filled with duck themed paraphernalia, like a Breeders of the Lost Stork movie poster, or a duck sized condom in his wallet. There's nothing too creepy about that, right? Well, I've got two words for you. Duck tits. That's right, during this introductory sequence we catch a glimpse of a nude female duck in an adjacent apartment. Ugh. As a character, Howard is actually interesting, somewhat amusing, and at times even endearing. As a concept, however, he's so truly bizarre and out of place, it's impossible to take the rest of the production seriously. Come here, snot nose! That's it. No more Mr. Nice Duck. Let the female creature go! Every duck's got his limit, and you, scum, have pushed me over the line. Jimmy, do you like to see what I see? A talking duck? Yeah, that's <laughs> it. I've been doing too much toot. Featured as a love interest opposite is the always beautiful Leia Thompson, whose cheery attitude and skimpy outfits make this PG-rated adventure almost watchable. Keyword there, almost. Of her alien friend's cold personality, she remarks, I bet you were born from a very hard-boiled egg, ducky. A love scene where the two begin engaging in interspecies relations is particularly uncomfortable, and should never have made it past the first draft. Strike two. These more glaring issues notwithstanding, the film commits some rather basic mistakes as well, like revealing a humanity-saving weapon that's still behind a fence. It's supposed to be this important shot signifying the best hope to save Earth, but we don't know what the device is or even what it looks like, as a majority of the frame is obscured. Despite being a big-budget adventure, the movie's idea of action is showing people repeatedly fall out of boats and having cars drive through locked fences. Later, a sequence when Howard and scientist sidekick Tim Robbins attempt to flee police officers in a small fixed-wing aircraft becomes extremely repetitive as the flying duo are constantly dodging obstacles. Here's an idea, gain altitude and stay there! But it's the climax where things really get weird, when bad guy Jeffrey Jones as a possessed evil overlord begins shooting colorful lasers at everyone. Talking ducks is one thing, but glow-in-the-dark Sith Lords is on another level of bad writing. Strike three. Objectively speaking, there are some redeeming qualities here, but the film never does enough to pull itself out of the depths of cinematic excrement. Marvel completionists and the truly brave may want to check this out, but seeing it once was one time too many for me. Howard the Duck is a peculiar mess of bad ideas. I thought it was garbage. For those unfamiliar, I re-upload every individual review from this show to the Movie Night Archive channel, which is specifically designed to help you find movies by rating, year, or category. I also chat about upcoming films as well, commenting on their trailers. This week I published my thoughts on Suicide Squad and Batman vs Superman. So head over to youtube.com slash movie night to check that out. Fourth tonight on our list of worst films ever is Theodore Rex. Well first off, this exists. It's not a joke or a parody, but an honest-to-god motion picture that hundreds of people actually created. On purpose. Originally intended for theatrical release in North America, New Line Cinema was so demoralized by early screenings they decided to release it direct-to-video instead, making this $33 million disappointment the most expensive home video ever made, when it was released stateside in July of 1996. In fact, the action comedy film is the only direct-to-video production to be nominated for a Razzie Award. In a weird alternate universe, a tough female police detective is paired with a talking dinosaur to track down the culprit of a mysterious murder of another dinosaur, which they refer to as a dinocide. Upon hearing that EGOT-winning Whoopi Goldberg stars in this train wreck, my immediate reaction was, why? But to her credit, she desperately tried to back out of her verbal agreement. It was only after being sued by the producer and offered a $7 million salary that she reluctantly took the gig. Coltrane, there's been a homicide and your name came up. Am I a suspect? Uh, actually, it was a dinocide. A dinosaur is dead. Teddy Rex, meet Katie Coltrane. Hi. You two solve this case together. <laughs> whoa, 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 what, what? Teddy's in public relations, but I'm feel promoting him temporarily. He's a dinosaur. Come on, Coltrane. He graduated from the academy just like you did. He's a dinosaur. You're not a specist, are you? <laughs> Give me results by prime time tomorrow, and I'll double your regular commissions. To be fair though, dinosaurs were a huge craze in the early 90s. From Jurassic Park to the Dinosaurs TV series, those giant lizards could get greenlit in almost anything. Goldberg stars alongside the title character, a six-foot puppet voiced by George Nebern, whose human behavior and abilities are never explained, or even addressed. 
While both of their performances are god-awful, they are at least accomplished with a straight face, which is more than I can say about myself when I watch this shameless story. The two go through the typical good cop, bad cop motions while interrogating a lead, resulting in Whoopi balking at Rex's aggressive tactics by shouting, No, you cannot eat our only suspect! The PG-rated adventure has such a wildly inconsistent tone, though, bouncing from inspirational monologues about rising above our personal limitations to an oft-repeated physical gag involving Rex's gigantic tail. Indeed, while director Jonathan R. Battelle could have used this vehicle as a fascinating analogy for 20th century racism and discrimination, he instead goes for fart jokes in every third scene. One dumb montage has Teddy Rex trying on a variety of goofy outfits via some unexplained teleportation system, reciting distasteful impressions of each in what quickly becomes the most cringeworthy scene in the entire film. Speaking of costumes, Whoopi remains dressed in an unflattering jumpsuit for the entire duration. Theodore Rex unravels without any tension or energy, making it feel much longer and slower than it actually is. Perhaps this family-friendly experience would work as a cartoon show, but as a live-action motion picture, it's practically impossible to take seriously, especially once respected actor Armin Mueller Stahl shows up as a mad scientist, hell-bent on creating another Ice Age for some reason. There is, in fact, a musical score in this movie, created by the prolific, if subpar, Robert Folk, but I was too damn distracted by the nonsense on screen to even notice it. The filming style is pretty bland as well, but it does a decent job showing the bizarre futuristic locations, which are lit up like a light-bright theme park. Technically speaking, the movie is competently put together. The audio mix, editing, direction are all passable, which makes it that much harder to understand how this even came to be. Emphasizing some quality moral lessons, this might not be a total waste for younger viewers, but unless you're morbidly curious or three years old, save yourself 92 minutes of boredom and avoid this ridiculous farce. Theodore Rex is an embarrassing and unbelievably stupid concept masquerading as a family comedy. I thought it was garbage. Finally tonight, my review of Food Fight. After a decade of setbacks, production delays, and legal issues, this computer-animated comedy saw a low-key, contractually obligated direct-to-video release in May of 2013. Thanks to the aforementioned problems and what can only be described as gross financial mismanagement, this abomination cost an estimated $45 million to make. It earned back less than 100000 Before we go any further, though, I have to address the abysmal quality of the picture's visuals. The sheer ineptitude of Threshold Animation Studios cannot be overstated. The facial expressions are unsynchronized, the textures are boring, and the character designs are ugly. The animation here is so terrible, it resembles one of those quick and dirty South Korean news reports if it were rendered with a Nintendo 64. Sans expansion pack. If the animation itself wasn't bad enough, the actual shot composition and framing is just as awful. Unmotivated dolly moves, bizarre close-ups, and inconsistent lighting, including one scene where the character's shadows change direction and size five times in a single minute. And whom do we have to thank for this cluttered mess? Writer, producer, and director Lawrence Kasanoff. The PG-rated story follows a group of food mascots who battle each other for control of the supermarket when it comes alive after closing time. Portraying these misfit weirdos is a cast of generally talented individuals. Charlie Sheen, Hilary Duff, Ava Longoria, Wayne Brady, Christopher Lloyd, Chris Kattan, Larry Miller, Ed Asner, and Jerry Stiller. I list each of them by name, if only to serve as a reminder that these are quite possibly the worst performances of their professional careers. This is especially true for Sheen, who carries a bulk of the dialogue, clearly phoning in his delivery without an ounce of energy or enthusiasm. If his portrayal of the heroic dog detective was actually entertaining, Food Fight might have had a chance. I honestly have to wonder, though, if the producers kidnapped a member of his family to force his cooperation. The lines he does deliver, either willingly or under duress, are nothing but wall-to-wall -wall puns and crude sexual innuendo. Choice examples, which are generally spoken without context, include Once more unto the bleach, and Frankly, dear, I don't give a spam. Changing a famous quote to some food-related rhyme isn't how comedy works. I am hot! I'm hot, hot, hot! Go to fry! Stay calm. Go to crisp. We just gotta find a way to get out. Whoa, 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 whoa. Just breathe and focus. The answer will come. What? The answer will come! I, I'm melting and you're getting all martial arts zen! You can put a... Ah! Socks! That's it. Socks always escape from the dryer. Follow that sock. <laughs> Ouch! Okay, pal. You're safe now. Although the overarching plot and themes are extremely vague, there is inherently a neat concept here. Similar to Toy Story, it would be pretty cool to see famous mascots come to life and interact with one another. Would the Keebler Elves be next-door neighbors to Aunt Jemima? Obviously, though, the execution here touches on none of that, opting to include Nazi overtones and imagery instead. The repeated musical cues breathe some life into the movie, but I have sincere doubts Walter Murphy composed the material specifically for this film. It feels like unconnected leftovers from a better score. 
Bereft of actual content, but still desperate to stretch the film to a feature-length runtime, the movie ends with nine full minutes of credits. That's 10% of the picture. Honestly, I can barely find the words to describe this mess. So let's break out the thesaurus. Appalling, depressing, horrendous, disgusting, atrocious, dreadful, ghastly, hideous, horrifying, unpleasant, deplorable, offensive, and unsightly are all descriptions of this movie. Thankfully, I didn't pay to see it, but I still feel like asking for my money back. Avoid at all costs. Food Fight isn't just an insulting pile of shit, it's also the worst animated movie of all time. My final rating is obviously garbage. Lastly tonight, let's check out some of your tweet critiques. If you see a new movie in theaters, tweet your review with the JPMN hashtag. As we take a look back on the 130 plus films I reviewed in season six, it's time to wrap up another successful run. I can say with confidence these past 32 episodes were my best yet, but I'm always looking for ways to improve, so please leave any feedback or suggestions on what you'd like to see next season in the comments below. If you paid close attention, you might have noticed that although I reviewed more movies this year than ever before, my upload schedule was particularly inconsistent, and that's largely due to spreading myself too thin and just burning out. So at the very least, expect a more relaxed schedule when Movie Night returns with a brand new season in October. Before then, though, keep an eye out for a couple summer specials I have planned, including a look at the entire Mission Impossible franchise and more box office bombs. Also, be sure to stay subscribed to the Jog Wheel channel for all new episodes of Don't Eat the Spam, Game Time Hangouts, and some fun Jog Wheel originals I'm already working on. If you'd like to see more Movie Night, check out the related reviews on the right, or click subscribe. Also, be sure to follow me on social media for updates and exclusive content. Once again, my name is Jonathan Paula. Thank you for watching and listening. Until next time, have a good movie night.